Remember how before this thing got wrecked, we compared it to a custom Core i9 PC, determining that the consumer hardware was a better value? Well, those Skylake W chips are not exclusive to the iMac Pro. So what if you were to put one of them in a PC? What is a Xeon W and how does Intel justify the hefty premium that you would pay over a desktop Core i9? We're not sure. What we do know though is Origin PC sponsored today's video. Origin offers beautiful custom desktops, laptops, and lifetime 24-7 technical support. They use only high quality products like Samsung's 960 Pro M.2 SSDs, and you can visit Origin PC through the link below for a limited time offer. So I've got two benches here for us today. Both of them are running very similar Asus workstation boards. Like, I wouldn't call these guys brother and sister, but if they were cousins, they probably wouldn't want to get married. So there's the X299 Sage, that's running the X299 chipset that you're probably already familiar with. And the other one is running a chipset that Intel calls C422. And you will need a C422 board if you want to run a Xeon W. So with this chipset, the main thing that you gain is support for vPro, whose claim to fame, among other things, is remote management with the convenience and vulnerability that comes along with that. What you lose is support for Intel's Optane storage acceleration. Otherwise, they are pretty similar in their capabilities. Another feature of Xeon W is official support for up to 512 gigabytes of system memory. Though it should be noted that some X299 motherboards are compatible with registered DIMMs, meaning that they can also run 512 gigs of RAM with a regular Core i9. So then if it wasn't for Intel making ECC a Xeon exclusive feature, um, there wouldn't really appear to be any difference between them whatsoever. Now, ECC memory, which we've actually covered in more depth before here, is not faster than regular RAM. What makes it special and what makes it more expensive is the fact that on the fly, it can actually check for and correct errors, improving overall system reliability. This is a desirable feature for any system that's running mission critical applications. As for the CPUs themselves, well, with a couple of exceptions, they line up almost one to one with the Core X series lineup, which is to say they've got the same cache, the same core counts, and they even fit in the same socket. Where they differ, is in the Xeons gaining an extra four PCI Express lanes while losing support for Turbo Boost Max. Though it should be noted that many of them have a higher Turbo Boost 2.0 speed to compensate, making that last bit sort of a non-issue and also kind of raising the question as to why we have to have a software application that only works in Windows for the desktop processors anyway. So with both benches assembled, all that's left now is to do a little bit of tuning to make sure that our tests are fair. The main thing is just to make sure that our memory is running at the same speed, which it is. So to recap, here are the hardware configurations that we're running today. Now let's run some benchmarks, starting with our two eight core chips to see if maybe, just maybe, there is something that we have overlooked. Yeah, okay. Moving on to our other tests, we see the slight difference. A 100 megahertz higher base clock makes for gaming, actually giving the Xeon W2145 an edge over its Core i7 counterpart. So that's good news if you were concerned that your serious business workstation wouldn't be able to game off hours. You can put those fears to rest. And then as for the heavy multi-threaded tests like Blender, the differences shrink down to a maximum of 16 seconds and don't really seem to get any worse over time, meaning that the difference
basically comes down to how high and for how long the chips boost during the early phase of the run thanks to their slightly different turbo implementations. So I guess it's time for us to do a quick chip swap here. Now we're on to our second pair, and just like the previous ones, the differences aren't exactly striking. Neither chip really seems to gain a firm advantage over the other, and it's a dead heat in our synthetic gaming tests. Once again, lightly threaded workloads favor Turbo Boost Max, and our numbers tighten up considerably when we pour on the juice in Blender. This time, however, we've got a maximum delta of about a minute with the 7900X taking the crown on the Gooseberry render. Let's try the heavyweights now, shall we? We've got both systems loaded up with their 18 core variants. So which monster CPU is more monstrous? Well, surprisingly, our 7980 wrecked the Xeon W2195 in Deus Ex thanks to its higher base and turbo boost clocks. And while it's not as big a victory as in our synthetic gaming tests, it's still a win for the Core i9. And then, it's the same story across the rest of our tests, regardless of threading. We also saw our biggest upset in Blender with the Core i9 winning by over a minute and a half on the Gooseberry render. So, if the performance is as similar in real life, as the spec sheets would seem to indicate, with neither the consumer chips pulling ahead in consumer workloads like games, nor the workstation chips pulling ahead in workstation workloads, it makes it honestly pretty difficult for me to wrap my head around the reason that this lineup of CPUs and this chipset exists. Now, traditionally, Xeon's based on the consumer 11XX sockets only had ECC as their main selling point, but those came at a relatively small premium. Whereas, again, traditionally, the expensive Xeons with many cores, well, they had the ability to run on dual socket boards as an easy justification. But this generation lacks that capability, meaning that unless you absolutely need vPro and ECC memory support, the latter being something that AMD's entire lineup from Ryzen 3 to Threadripper supports natively, and the former being something that Intel's own consumer products support, <sighs> it kind of smells like mostly marketing, but uh, with a subtle undertone of extra PCI Express lanes. So at the end of the day, I think what it comes down to is that Xeon has a lot more brand recognition than Core does in the workstation and enterprise space. So if Intel can charge more for it, I guess they might as well. But for our viewers, I'll say this. As long as you don't stand to lose a hundred bucks worth of work every time your system blue screens due to a bit flip, we're recommending to stick with the consumer Core i9. Private internet access supports a variety of VPN protocols and types of encryption and authentication, which allows you to dial in exactly the level of privacy protection you need. Here's just a few reasons why you should use PIA VPN. It offers IP cloaking so you can hide your true IP address and geographic location. It allows you to browse anonymously, keeping your identity hidden. It allows you to avoid data mining and targeted advertising and block unwanted connections with advanced firewall and filtering capabilities to keep all network intrusions out. So check them out today through the link in the video description. So thanks for watching guys. If you just like this video, you can hit that button. But if you liked it, hit like, Get subscribed, maybe consider checking out where to buy the stuff we featured at the link in the video description. Also down there is our merch store, which has cool shirts like this one, as well as our community forum, which I would totally recommend that you join.